Hello friends, Brian here. I want to welcome you back to Forward Church, to Church Online. So I'm glad that we get to gather together this way and really go through God's Word together, have some digital community, and really, man, be church together even though we're church together online. So thanks for being here. I'm really glad that we get to do this. I'm also super excited about this message. This message I'm going to share with us on one of my favorite topics to talk about, and that is the peace that Jesus gives. See, God gives peace that's unlike any other peace. And for many of us, especially living through this pandemic that we've lived through, like we could use a little peace. We could use a little good news. And so that's what we're going to share today. I'm going to actually be reading from Luke's gospel. I'm going to be in Luke chapter 3. Now Luke's in the New Testament, and Luke is what's referred to as a gospel. A gospel is one of the biographies of the life of Jesus. And so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four gospels I'm going to be reading out of the gospel of Luke chapter 3. Now, as you're finding that, maybe you're finding it in your Bible app or your tablet or, or just your old-fashioned paper Bible, <clears throat> as you're turning there, I want you to know that as we lean into this Christmas season, this Advent season, we're actually leaning into a time when we're reminded of the first coming of Jesus. See, that's what the word Advent means. The word Advent means an appearing or a coming. And so as the church starts to celebrate the season referred to as Advent, it actually goes way, way back. Like the first recorded occurrences we have of Christians celebrating what we refer to as Advent um, is like in the third century, the fourth, the third or fourth century. So Christians for almost two millennia have really been making a big deal about this time of year because this time of year reminds us that God came to the earth in the form of Jesus in order to save sinners. That's you and that's me. And it's a great time for us to remind ourselves that because Jesus appeared on your behalf and on my behalf, we can have peace and joy and love and all of those good things that come along with be, with being connected to God. And so if you're watching this today and you're a follower of Jesus, that's what you have access to. Isn't that exciting? Now, if you're watching this today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to let you know that God loves you tremendously and he wants to draw you to him and give you that peace and give you that hope and give you that love. So welcome in. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 3. And as we are, we're in this Christmas series that we're calling Moss. And the word Moss is a Spanish word that means more. And we want to talk about how Jesus appeared on this earth in order to give us more connection to God, more love, more joy, more hope, and in today's message, more peace. And so we're going to look at that in Luke chapter 3. So look with me together in Luke chapter 3. It says, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke 3 says this, <clears throat> I'm sorry, got, got mixed up for a second there. It was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. That's God's word for you and for me today as we talk about the appearing of Jesus to bring us the peace of God. So thank God for his word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today, that you would encourage us, help us have the peace of God, and help us to uh, really connect with you in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this language that Luke uses in his gospel is really interesting. 
the language that he's using, first of all, he's quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, but also he kind of has some allusions to something that happens in Malachi chapter 3. And it's this idea of a messenger that will go before the Lord. And what Luke does is he connects this messenger as John the Baptist. That's actually how all the New Testament writers do. They connect this prophetic voice that will shout, prepare the way of the Lord with John the Baptist. And so we see that John the Baptist goes out into this wilderness and he's preaching to people a message of repentance to prepare their heart for the coming of Jesus. Now, that's really interesting that he connects these Old Testament dots from Isaiah 40 and from Malachi chapter 3. But also, there is something deeper that's happening here. <clears throat> See, the picture that Luke is painting, <clears throat> and really the picture that Isaiah has painted and that Malachi has painted uh, approximately 600 or so years prior to Luke, is that when the Lord comes, the Lord will be a king that will go into his new territory. See, this idea of one going in the wilderness shouting, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, that hills and valleys will be, the hills will be broken down and the valleys will be built in and crooked, curvy roads will be made straight. Well, what happens is this is the picture of a royal envoy going forth to prepare the highway for the king to come in and take a visit. Excuse me a second, my throat is acting a little funky. <clears throat> So, this idea of a royal envoy is really interesting. Not too long ago, I watched a series on, uh, I think it was Netflix, that was talking about uh, presidential secrets. Now, the secrets aren't too secret if it's a series on Netflix, but at any rate, one of the things that it talked about was when a president goes on an international trip, there's so many logistics that go into that. And part of the logistics <clears throat> deal with making sure that the airport will be safe for the president to fly into on Air Force One, making sure um, that it can be secure, making sure that the roadways that the president's going to be driving on are going to be safe and blocked off. And there are so many different logistics that go into that. Well, that's essentially what we're reading here, is that Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 40, Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, and now Luke and Luke chapter 3 are all saying the same thing, that there's going to be a royal visitation that God, the king, will come in. And as he comes in, we've got to prepare the way for the king. Now, we see this naturally, that when kings would go to a new place in the Old Testament days, in the, the B.C. era, what they would do is they would send out parties, royal envoys, that would go forth and literally would fix the road. So if there were like potholes in the road, they would fill those potholes in. If there were mountainous hills and they couldn't find a way around them, they would literally start um, like digging sand and rocks away from those mountainous hilly areas because they wanted it to be as smooth and comfortable and safe as possible for the king to come in. Well, that's what John the Baptist is doing as he's preaching repentance. Now, it's important for you and me to see the principle here is that if we're going to experience the peace of God, the peace of God comes into repentant hearts, into hearts that are ready and prepared to turn away from our sin to turn away from our fleshly longings and to simply receive the king. Now, maybe there's some crooked places in your heart that you need to repent. Maybe there's some hills and valleys and potholes in your life that you need to repent and ask the Lord to prepare a way in your heart for the coming of Jesus. And, and, and here's the truth, guys. <clears throat> we all have those places. Like you have them, I have them. Like, like we all have those places. And so if I could encourage you in any way today, it would definitely be to have an open heart for the Lord to clear away some of those places. And so as we see that John's preparing the way for the king to come in, well, John's preparing the way for Jesus, which tells us that the Lord that Isaiah referred to and that Malachi referred to is Jesus. So we see that Jesus is not just some prophet. He's not just some teacher or worker of miracles, but rather Jesus is the Lord, as is referred to in the Old Testament. And Jesus is the royal king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords that will be set to come. Now, Jesus appeared, his advent happened one time 2,000 years ago in Palestine, and we're looking ahead towards his second advent. For Jesus said this, 
that he's going away to prepare a place and that one day he will return and get his disciples so that they can be where he is. So we're in between Advents. We're after his first Advent and we're looking towards his second with hope. And in the meantime, it's up to you and me to make sure that we're preparing a way for the Lord to come. So we see this kind of big idea that I want to share with us about peace today is wrapped around Jesus being our king. And here we go. Here's what I want to say. Because Jesus is king over all, we can have his peace over all. I want to say that again because it's a really important foundational concept. Because Jesus is king over all, we can have his peace over all. That means that if Jesus is the king over all of the earth, if Jesus is the king of kings, the king over all rulers and principalities and powers, as the Bible teaches us, then he's also the king of peace over my life. He's also the king over medical diagnoses in my life. He's the king over pandemics. He's the king over marital problems. He's the king over family issues. He's the king over my job. He's the king over my sin. And because he's the king over all, I can have his peace over all areas of my life. And that's a beautiful truth and a beautiful principle. Now, I want to talk about what that means. So I'm going to kind of break that down. The first thing to notice is that Jesus is king. We see this kingly language that an envoy will go forth and will say, prepare the way for the Lord, for the king to come through. But it's important to know that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament actually anticipates a future king. And this future king will be from the royal line of David. Now, David is probably most popular for being the David who killed Goliath. Most people are familiar with the David and Goliath concept, if not the story. Well, David was actually considered a man after God's own heart. He's someone who God specifically chose because his heart was bent towards honoring God. Now, if you know anything about David's story, you know that he wasn't perfect. He actually had some major, major character defects. But what set David apart was that he was quick to repent. He had a repentant heart that was willing to, as we talked earlier, to fill in the valleys, to fix the potholes, to be open to God's, to repent towards God. And so God gives this promise to David that he will always have a son to sit on the throne of God's people, Israel. And so in the Old Testament, there's this anticipation of a Davidic king who will come and fulfill all the promises that the prophets have spoken of. And here we see that that king is fulfilled in Jesus. See, Jesus was from the line of David. When you read about the genealogy of Jesus, you see that he comes from David's line. As a matter of fact, Jesus is referred to as the branch of David, the new tree, the new growth in the line of David. And he's referred to as the king of kings. As a matter of fact, all throughout the life of Jesus, you see this kingship attached with him. When Jesus is born, we see that there are some wise men that eventually make their way to Jesus and they go to the palace asking, where's the newborn king? We saw his star in the sky and we have come to worship him. Jesus was referred to as a king. They went to the palace because they were looking for a royal birth. Mm -hmm. We see as Jesus lives his life, oftentimes people consider him the son of David. They're asking um, one time in particular, I think it's a guy by the name of Bartimaeus and he's blind and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's connecting him with the royal lineage of David's tribe or, or David's family. Then when Jesus <clears throat> is arrested and taken before Pontius Pilate, one of the people that Luke mentions in his earlier line of what we read today, we see that Jesus is being accused as claiming to be the king of the Jews. As a matter of fact, Jesus has an interesting conversation with Pilate, and you can find that in uh, John chapter 19 where Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus essentially says, yes, just as you say I am. And he says that his kingdom is not of this world. When Jesus is crucified above his head, there's a plaque that is written in every language of the day or every language of Palestine at the time. Here is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So we see that Jesus is king, but he's not just this king in our sense of the word that, oh, he's, he's majestic. He is all of those things, but y'all, he's the fulfillment 
of all of what the Old Testament prophets looked ahead towards. He's the ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate king of God, the ultimate king that has come to the earth. Now, he said that his kingdom is not of this world, and one day Christ will return. And when he returns, he will return with great glory and great power and fully establish the kingdom of God. And so we're even taught in the New Testament to long for his appearing. We're told to desire the return of Christ because that's when the kingdom of God will completely restore everything to the, to the original factory settings that God had for it. So we see that Jesus is a king overall, but I want to go back to those verses that we read before from Luke's gospel. And I want to look at uh, what Luke does here. It's really interesting, okay? Here's what we see in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. Now, the reason that I bring that up is because Luke is really funny. Luke is a historian, but he's also a theologian. And what that means is this. Luke was very smart about making sure that he told history the accurate way. He says it was the 15th year of the reign of King Tiberius. He gives us a specific date that we can look at. It's important for you to know that as a follower of Jesus, and maybe you're watching this and you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been skeptical about the Bible and can you trust the Bible? Well, the Bible talks about real historical events that took place. You can actually trace the history back to the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. This story of Jesus is not a fairy tale, and it's not a reinvention of some ancient story appropriated for a first century Jewish context. No, this is a history. This is a story of something that actually happened and took place in history. So you see Luke the historian, but look at what Luke the theologian is doing as well. He shows us that the king is born amongst all of this other political situation. See, if you read in this, what you'll see is there are five political leaders and two religious leaders. You see that there's Herod, Pontius Pilate, Herod's brother. You see that there are these five political leaders, and then Annas and Caiaphas are the high priests, the religious leaders. And then we see that the king of glory is born amongst this. And what is it that Luke's trying to tell us? Well, Luke is trying to tell us that Jesus is king over whatever's happening in the political realm, and Jesus is king over whatever's happening in the religious realm as well. It doesn't matter who the governor or who the ruler is. It doesn't matter who the high priest is. The true king and the true high priest, Jesus, has now been born. And because Jesus is higher than the high priest, because Jesus is higher than the king, Jesus is king over all. I really think that there are many of us that don't have a big enough picture of who Jesus is in our lives. We think that our issues are bigger than our issue fixer. We think that the stuff that we have going on is bigger than the peace that God came to bring and to give. And I want you to know, because Jesus is king over all, you, my friend, can have his peace over all. We often find this lack of peace around politics. We can hitch our peace wagon, so to speak, over who's in office. And it happens every three years as we're going into election cycles. In America, we have major presidential elections every four years, but about every three years is when the campaigns start to, to, to ramp up. And it's in those moments where we have all kinds of unrest and we lose our peace. Because we can sometimes be so attached to our political leanings and our political desires that we forget that Jesus is king over all of that. Now, it's important that you are educated politically, and it's important that you exercise your right to vote. I'm not telling you not to do that. But what I'm reminding us to do, I'm hopefully like a John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness to try to let you know that regardless of what party's in office, Jesus is king above all. And so don't let your peace come from the price of gas. Don't let your peace come from who sits in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Don't let your peace come from a red state or a blue state. Let your peace come from the king above all. 
Now, he shows that it's not just political leaders, but it's also religious leaders. He shows Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. And you can really only have one high priest at a time. But what, what we see here is that Annas was such a strong voice that he was actually kind of considered um, like a pseudo high priest. And here's what I mean. You see this happening in colleges and universities all the time. A president will retire, but will be considered emer em emeritus. I think is how you pronounce that word. Or it's like when a, when a president of the United States is no longer in office. We still will refer to that person as president so-and-so, even though they're not currently presiding. They're not currently in that office. Well, Annas was <clears throat> such a powerful figure as a high priest, he was still considered in that role. But here's what the point is. No matter who is the king or who is the high priest, Jesus is above all of that. And so because Jesus is king over all, we can have his peace over all. Now, Luke tells us that John came preaching in the wilderness about the repentance of God. We see here at the second part of this, at this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of God, of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Now it's important that we see that the salvation that was sent from God is for all people. See, part of what salvation came for in the mind and the eyes of the Jews was just for Israel. But we see that the true King of God, Jesus, brought salvation to all people, not just the Jews in the first century, not just the ethnic group of people referred to as the Jewish nation of Israel, but rather to all of us non-Jews, or as the Bible would refer to us, as Gentiles. See, Jesus came to bring salvation to all, and that salvation is peace with God, and by extension, peace with others. So, Jesus has essentially broken down any kind of wall that divides us from God, as well as any kind of wall that divides us from someone else. So because Jesus is king over all, we can have his peace over all. See, Jesus desires that all people would be saved. He has a heart for you, my friend. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how sinful you may feel. Jesus is greater than your past sins, and Jesus is greater than your future sins. He came to seek and to save all those that are lost. He came to bring us peace with God. Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. You can read about it in John chapter 14. And Jesus says, my peace I give to you. He said, I don't give you peace the same way the world gives, but rather I give you my peace that's so much greater. Maybe you feel like you don't have the peace of God. Let me tell you, Jesus is here to give you that peace. Even today, if you'll simply ask him into your heart, if you'll simply ask him, Lord, give me that peace. He's here to give you that peace. He's here to give you peace between God vertically, and he's here to work out peace horizontally in other areas of your life. You know, the Bible says that those that are followers of Jesus have the Spirit of God on the inside of them. And because we have the Spirit of God on the inside of us, we actually produce fruit. We're called to be fruity people, okay? But most people are just nutty people, not fruity people. But because we have the Spirit of God on the inside of us, we're actually called to produce fruit. And one of the characteristics of the fruit of the, the, the Spirit is peace. So you can read about this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. And so as a follower of Jesus, you may not feel the peace of God, but you have the fruit of the peace of God in your life. You have the Spirit of God to help walk you and guide you into peace. Paul the Apostle actually was a really important leader in the New Testament, and he wrote a letter to a church in a city called Philippi. Now, in your New Testament, that letter is called Philippians. 
And when Paul was writing to the Philippians, he said to them this really interesting phrase in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He tells them to not be anxious about anything, but rather to pray about it, to bring their stuff to God. Don't be anxious about it, but rather bring it to God. And he says that when you bring this to God, that the peace that passes all understanding will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. See, there are situations and moments in life where you can't understand why you have the peace of God, but God's peace goes beyond our understanding and it guards our hearts and it guards our minds. What does that mean? Well, it's this poetic way to say that it guards all of us. It guards how we think. It guards how we feel. It guards what's going on. See, that's the access. That, that's the peace of God that you have access to, friends. Where is it in your life that you need this peace today? Is it over your finances? God is there to bring peace. Is it over your marriage? Maybe you want to be married, but it seems like every person that you go on a date with is just not the right one or there's not a connection and you're feeling lonely and you're feeling like you don't want to put yourself out there again. I want to speak the peace of God over you today. Maybe you're hurting because we're going into the holiday season and there are loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord and you're hurting because of that. That's a huge, huge gap in your life and you need the peace of God to help you and to strengthen you during this time. I don't know where you're at, but here's what I know. God wants to give that peace to you. He wants that peace that's not the way the world gives, this extraordinary peace, this peace of God that will guard your heart and guard your mind. I'll never forget, it was uh, 10 years ago when my sister got really sick and it randomly came up out of the blue. She got really sick, and uh, she called me on the phone. And when she called me on the phone, she was in tears, and I could I could hear the fear in her voice. And she said, uh, at this time, I lived in a different state. I lived in Georgia. My family, I'm originally from North Carolina. And so she calls me from Carolina, and she's like, hey, I need you to come home. Something uh, like, I'm sick. I need you to come home. And I, I remember, man, I, I was at work. I, I left that day. I, I got my wife. We loaded everything up in the car, and we immediately started going to North Carolina because my sister called me. She's my best friend. And this was one of those rare moments where I let my wife drive for a little while. I'm one of those husbands that I have to have my hands on the wheel. I have to be the one driving. But, but this time I was letting her drive, and I was over in the passenger seat, and I was reading through the Bible. You know, I went to Bible college. I was a pastor at the time. Like I, I've read through the Bible a couple of times. I, I've, I've every verse in the Bible. I've read it at least one time. But for some reason, on this day, the Holy Spirit caused this one verse to jump out at me, and it was almost like I had never read the Bible a day in my life before. Have you ever been there before? Well, the verse that jumped out to me was in Ephesians, and this is what it says: He Himself is our peace. Now, the he himself is Jesus that he's referring to, but the verse is Jesus. He himself is our peace. And I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I knew that he was, he was welding that verse onto my heart. Now, I didn't know that I was driving to North Carolina to see my sister for the last time. By the time I got there, she had slipped into a coma and... I was able to go into the hospital room with her alive and, and talk with her and tell her how much I love her and how much she meant to me. And 24 hours later, she passed on from this side of eternity into the other side of eternity to be with Jesus. And can I tell you, it was during that entire process, while it was painful and while I will miss her every day on this side of eternity, that verse was really true. Jesus was my peace. Jesus was my sister's peace when she breathed her last breath. And, and friends, I hope that Jesus is our peace when we breathe our last breath. Now, let me tell you, it was difficult to work through that healing process. Even today, 10 years later, I still hurt and I still miss her dearly. But I found that where the pain is great, the peace and the grace of God can be even greater. See, friends, we're in Advent and we're celebrating when he first appeared, but we're longingly looking ahead to when he will return the second time and where he will set the world right 
And here's what I know about you. Either Jesus will return to get you as a follower of Christ, or you will die and you will meet Jesus that way. Now, maybe you're not a follower of Christ. When Jesus returns, it's not good news if you're not a follower of Jesus. And when you die and not a follower of Jesus, you will stand before God one day. And the only thing that we can say to a holy God when we stand before him is that our sins were paid for by the blood of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to open your heart to allow Jesus to be your peace. I want to encourage you to prepare the valley, prepare the road, prepare the way for Jesus to come to your heart right here today. Prepare the way for Jesus to come into your situation. Maybe you need financial peace, and maybe the way to prepare that is to take a course like Financial Peace University, or I once was broke, but now I'm not. Maybe you need to prepare the way by putting a budget together and having someone that can hold you accountable financially. Maybe there's some marriage problems that are going on, and maybe you can prepare the way and open up the door for peace by seeking counseling or by going to a pastor or by uh, maybe, maybe this is just a long shot, but maybe you could just forgive and have a repentant heart toward your spouse and tell them that you're sorry for what's going on. I don't know every individual situation, but here's what I know. If we will prepare the way for the Lord and will open our hearts for his peace, we will experience the peace that passes understanding and we'll see that he himself is our peace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. God, first I ask for you to give us that peace that comes only through Jesus. Lord, thank you for being faithful, even when we're not. As I tell the story about going to see Angie that final time, I'm reminded that you are my peace. And so I yield to you. I invite you to be my peace, and I ask you to be the peace of all those that are watching this message today. Whatever it is that they have going on, wherever it is that they are in life right now, be their peace. And Lord, I pray for those that are watching this that have yet to open their hearts to Jesus. May today be the day when they prepare their heart, when they prepare the way where they open themselves up to you. And so we ask you to do these things and to be glorified in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I love you. Thank you so much for spending time with me. It means the world to me that we get to gather together this way. I hope that you've gotten a lot out of this message. There are two things that I want to say on the way out. The first one is, if you gave your life to Jesus, I am so excited to welcome you to the family of God. Now, maybe this is the first time you gave your life to Christ, or the second time you gave your life to Christ, or the 200th, wherever it is, welcome to the family of God. Here's what I'm going to ask. If you will click the link, there's a link in the description of this video that goes to forwardchurch.me slash next steps. And on that, that shows a variety of what next steps are for you as a follower of Jesus. But there's a tab up there that says, I got saved today, or I gave my life to Jesus. Would you click that and just get in contact with us so that we can reach out to you and welcome you to the family and help kind of plug you into a place. Maybe it's a local church wherever you live, or maybe it's continuing to be church online. Whatever it is, we don't want you to do life alone, especially as a follower of Christ. We want to welcome you to the family. So if you'll do that, that would be awesome. The second thing is this. There are so many of you that are financially supporting the ministry of Forward Church. I want you to know, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you. Uh, there's so much that we're able to do with ministry because people like you support the ministries of Forward Church. So I love you so much. I want to tell you something that's coming around the bend uh, in 2022. We are currently right now preparing to purchase new equipment and to prepare to be able to fully live stream our services. Now, we're, there's a learning curve for us, and we're kind of connecting with other mentors that can help walk us through that process. But as we're doing that, we're looking at purchasing cameras and lighting equipment um, and soundboard equipment, things like that. Well, we're able to do that to get the message of Jesus out to more people because people like you financially give to Forward Church. So thank you so much for that. If you are giving, there's a link in the description here you can click. It will take you to our website, forwardchurch.me, and you can give there. Thank you guys so much for supporting the ministry of Forward Church, your church. 
I love you, and I look forward to talking with you next time as we continue this Moss Sermon Series, looking ahead, looking back on the first advent of Jesus, and looking ahead for when he returns again. I love you guys. I'm praying for you this week, and we'll see you next time, okay? Bye now.